But Nathan, uh, really appreciate you taking the time out to have another chat with us. Uh, the last time we spoke went down really well with the fan base and there was a lot of requests for us to do a follow-up. Um, you very kindly agreed to do this on camera. You know, fresh new trim, looking well. <laughs> um, so, yeah, really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, again, just wanted to have another general chit-chat, get to know you a bit better, a bit more about the, the scenario of the football club, etc. Um, so I'll jump straight into it. Um, one of the things that you spoke about the last time we had a chance to chat was that you were looking to build a physiotherapy de department rather than it just be you as an individual. Um, I've seen firsthand the training, the team effort that goes into this, and the eagle-eyed amongst the supporters may have noticed that you've not actually been the first responder onto the pitch in recent matches. So can you just talk us through a bit more of what this department and this vision looks like and who's involved and probably a bit about their background? Yeah, okay. So just for a bit of context, really, um, when the job was advertised, when, when Danny moved on, I, uh, I applied and, and I knew it was a little bit of a niche application because um, I'm in a really intense full-time job as a senior lecturer at Teesside University, teaching on the physio programme. Um, I'm also doing a PhD and I have a, a toddler who's coming up two this year at home. So in terms of my kind of work-life balance, the, the time commitment wasn't necessarily there for um, the games. And, and I put that to the club when I applied, but um, thankfully for, for myself and for the club, um, I've got a long-standing relationship with Luke, who does the games. And Luke is a qualified sports therapist. Um, he's actually studying his master's in physio at the moment as well at Teesside. And me and Luke have had a working relationship going back probably two and a half to three years now. My first involvement with him was him as a student and I was his supervisor. And then um, latterly, we kind of worked together at West Auckland where he was doing a lot of the pitch side stuff. And I was kind of a mentor slash um, line manager to him there as well. So the opportunity came up and I spoke to Luke about his um, willingness to be involved as well alongside me. And then Luke was keen put that to the club. The club were quite happy with the setup as well, given my previous experiences and how long I've been in and around football. Um, so yeah, brought Luke on board and, and Luke is who you see doing the games. And to be fair, Luke's contribution has been absolutely vital. He's an incredible part of the team um, and, and truly couldn't do this without Luke's help and involvement. He's been super keen, super enthusiastic, and he's just at the start of his journey, but I think he'll he'll go on to achieve really good things as a, as a physio in, in sport and probably football at the moment is his, his first choice. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy putting my time into mentoring Luke and developing Luke and bringing Luke's skills and, and um, experience on as much as we can during this uh, this role that we kind of job share, if you like. Um, but as part of that as well, we've also got some students as well. So we've got some sports therapy students and we've got some physiotherapy students who again have been really integral to this process and helping out and, and just giving us lots and lots of bodies and lots of options. Many hands make light work, as they say, and just having those bodies available and around just to help out with different bits and bobs has been very, very helpful to us, very helpful to the rest of the staff, but also to the lads more crucially. But also the, the students get a lot out of that as well, you know. Yeah, I was gonna say that's like a two-way street, surely. So they, they get a lot in return and you know it works both ways. Is, is that perhaps a door that's been opened because of your link with Teesside University? And is you know, is that something that's been helpful in the role that you now hold with us? You know, does it give you access to resources that perhaps a club like Darlington would normally have to go without? Yeah, exactly. And, and I think probably in hindsight, looking back, I think that was probably part of the appeal for the club to bring me in as well. Not just because of my experience in football, as we spoke about last time, but that link with Teesside University is really quite important because, like you say, it can unlock a lot of resources and kind of um, facilities that potentially Darlington wouldn't have had access to previously. But also from a kind of boots on the ground perspective, like I say, we've got some sports therapy students in, we've got some physio students in, but there's also vacancies out there for volunteer media staff and, and other bits and pieces in and around the club that my relationship with the football club and the university has helped to unlock. So as I say, I think that's probably what made me a little bit more of an attractive proposition when the job came up. Um, and I'm absolutely fine with that. I, I enjoy creating links and I think it's, it's really invaluable experience for students to get in and, and be working on the call face at a club like Darlington, which as you know, is, is a massive club for the, for the level we're currently at. Appreciate that. That's really great insight. Thanks, Nathan. Um, so take us back to when you first came in, which as we discussed last time was September last year. Um, what were your impressions of the setup uh, and, and what changes, if anything, have you implemented? Um, just talk us through your thought process on that, if you can. Um, yeah, so in terms of the setup, um, 
obviously it was a, a little bit different to, to what I've seen before. I, I've been at all levels of the pyramid. Like I said earlier, I've worked at West Auckland a couple of times, way back when I first qualified back in 2010 and recently um, kind of 2020, 2021, that sort of time as well. So being that, that, that kind of low down the pyramid, but also being with Middlesbrough as well in the full-time professional environment. So um, I've got experience of, of both ends of the football pyramid, if you like. Um, and I think the, the facilities and the kind of standard of facilities here was, was great, to be fair. Obviously, it's a little bit disjointed in terms of um, training at Eastbourne and sometimes we were doing analysis over at Blackwell Meadows at the ground um, and, and, and obviously most fans will be aware of the situation with the rugby club kind of owning the ground and, and us kind of leasing it off them if you like. Um, but no, in terms of the facilities available, I think the fact that we've got a 4G pitch probably at the moment is more pertinent than ever really because I've seen loads and loads of non-league games being called off because of the weather um, and, and we can't fall foul of that because we've got an all-weather pitch um, and I know we spoke about that at length last time in terms of the effects of all-weather pitches and maybe some of the myths around all-weather pitches and 4G surfaces but yeah, I think that's a, a real asset to the club that we've got a, an all-weather pitch that doesn't often get um, cancelled due to the weather. Yeah. Um, second part of the question was about some changes, wasn't it? So, it yeah, I think changes probably relates back to the, my answer from the last question. Danny had obviously done a, a great job, um, but he was a bit of a one-man band as well. Um, and, and as I've said, my work situation was, was pretty intense and pretty full on. And I had a vision for when I came into the club that I wanted to make a little bit more of a department and, and think about kind of succession planning and make the department a little bit more robust. Yeah. If anything did happen to me or my circumstances changed, I'd like to think Luke's ideally situated then to kind of take that on and, and, and push it forward and, and make the role his own and maybe bring someone in from the student pool to act as his Luke, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and kind of, and like I say, safeguard the club a little bit going forward that we've got a little bit of a succession plan in place that when people do move on, there's not a knee-jerk reaction and a, and a real struggle to find staff. We've got already people in place who might be potentially the first port of call to, to bring people on board as, as members of staff. So that was the only change, really. As I say, I, I think Danny ran a bit of a tight ship. Um, we've tried to continue that. And I, I like the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. A lot of the players were very, very happy with what Danny had done in the past. So we tried to keep continuity as much as possible. Obviously, every physio and every walk of life has got their own way of doing things. So there will be things that are slightly differently, differently done now and slight nuances that me and Luke have that maybe Danny didn't have and vice versa. But yeah, I think we, we kept a lot of things the same in all fairness. Excellent. Um couple more questions from me. This is, this is more to satisfy my curiosity, I suppose. Um, so when the club identifies a player that they're interested in signing, uh, what involvement do you or the physio department have in that? Do you, know, do you have any input into the medical, for example? Uh, and if so, you know, just tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so I think this, this varies from level to level, really. Um, so, like I say, West Auckland, at that kind of lower end of the spectrum, this wouldn't happen at all. They'd just sign players and, and that would be it. Then you've got the top end of the spectrum, your Premier League clubs, where they would be doing significant medicals probably over the course of a couple of days. We've probably all seen media outlets. Um, Real Madrid's probably the most popular one where, that we see publicised quite a lot where they get them on the treadmill, they're strapped up to heart monitors, they'll do exercise-related ECGs and heart scans, then they'll do resting ECGs, heart scans, they might even do brain scans. Um, but certainly for kind of for this level that we're at now, the main, main sort of process would be to to contact the player and um, the current club's physio and just speak a little bit about their injury history, what injuries have they had in the past, what was the rehab like, has there been any surgeries, has there been any recurring injuries because chances are if there's been a recurring injury before now, it's probably going to recur at some point again in the future. So you need to know about all of those things really. Um, and that's a little bit of a fact-finding mission, really. You're trying to find out as much as you can verbally as possible. Yeah. And then the next stage would be a kind of physical examination, if you like. So you'd get somebody in with consideration to their previous injury history. So let's say that they've had a lot of knee injuries. You, your assessment might focus in a little bit more detail on the knee. You'd still screen things like your ankle, your foot, your lower back, your hips, etc. Of course, you're going to still do all of that. But your focus might be primarily on the knee if they've had an ACL injury in the, the past, problem area for example. Past, yeah. yeah. So you'd do a little bit of that um, and then I would probably do some performance testing. So I would maybe look at a few functional movements and see how people move. Um, can they do a squat effectively? Can they lunge effectively? Maybe a, a deadlift pattern, things like that. Can they jump? Can they land effectively? All of these types of things. And, and it's a bit of a skill, a bit of an art, really. There's, there's not many ways to quantify things like that. You're just using your eye and your own experience in terms of how that person moves. Do they look comfortable? Do they move like... Um, 
like you would expect them to move and is their movement pattern efficient and um and, and suitable for the for the movement task that you're asking them to achieve really uh, and then finally probably some muscular endurance type testing in the clinical setting so you'd compare left and right so let's take that acl example um, you might check somebody's ability to do a single leg sit to stand on the affected leg versus the unaffected leg that can be a nice easy uh, measurable thing to assess and if they can do 20 on their unaffected leg and only 10 on the effective leg then obviously that's going to highlight maybe some red flags potentially that you might want to explore in a little bit more detail um, again higher up the chain you might think about doing mris if you're really concerned about particular areas but of course that comes with financial and budget implications so that's not not easy for a club like us to do um just off the cuff and i think probably most football league clubs even like conference uh sorry national league league two and league one probably wouldn't do that routinely but when you get to championship and, and premier league they probably would do that routinely i would suggest um and then the final stage probably that you would do would be some on-field testing maybe get somebody jogging running performing a warm-up doing some sprints get them doing some real functional tasks that are specific to the sport in this case football and see how they respond to that and, and just make sure again from a kind of artistic point of view because it's hard to quantify just make sure that they look like they're moving well potentially that's a really lengthy answer mate. i really appreciate <laughs> that that's, that's a fascinating insight i think um you know it gives us a real good indication as to the 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 involvement that goes in behind the scenes and um, even at a club like ours at the level that we're at you know it, it's quite an integral part of signing a player and um, so the the next question i've got for you mate and probably the last one before we have a chat about you know the squad and injuries etc uh -huh. is you know as we move towards next season and um, is there any elements that you'll be looking to add or change you know to, to strive for the continual improvement that everybody seeks in sport is there anything that we're looking to do a bit differently from a from a physical rehab perspective, you know, anything like that? Yeah, so, um, well, Luke, Luke's actually looking at doing a, a CPD, which is a continual professional development uh, course, and he's going to do a couple of days um, just kind of advancing his first aid and first responder skills, and he's, he's tried to book on with the FA. The places are limited, um, but he's hoping to do that kind of May-June time, I think, in the off-season, so that'll be perfect just to refresh his skills ready for the new season. Um, and then from a kind of a bigger picture perspective i'm hoping to try and support maybe the the academy and, and the kind of under 18s team and the, the women's team a little bit better with me coming in in october time september time this season um some of the students who were looking for placements had already been placed by then so if i can get in nice and early kind of july august then hopefully we've got a, a a bit of a bigger pool to choose from and hopefully got more students who'll be willing to come in and do placements with us and i just spoke to jarrett there who's currently the under 18s manager so hoping to just again just build that department really and, and just build a bit more of a kind of professional culture from a a, a sports science and medical yeah. professional point of view a bit more of a community club feel as well if everybody's yeah. getting involved and, and people are getting the same level of, of you know involvement and it can only board well for the club going forwards definitely and um, the last thing we're going to touch on this and obviously is is the squad the, the playing squad as it sits now um injuries we had quite a lengthy um update last time we spoke um and I think from the conversation we've had, you know, this update might not be as lengthy. So, you know, fire away. Where do we sit with, with squad at the moment? Any injuries? And you want to talk through uh, any treatment plans? Yeah, so um, a nice one to discuss actually tonight because we've got a clean bill of health as we sit here doing this video. So that's really good. So I remember last time we spoke, um, I gave an update on Cardo Siddick and Quasi Asante and said they were about a week to 10 days away. So yeah. they've both returned successfully to training and, and have both been back in training for a couple of weeks now. So they're both fit and available. Um, also, the last time we spoke, I think we just um, picked up a hamstring injury for Ben Liddle yeah. and for Jarrett Rivers as well. Um, Jarrett did his 48 hour turnaround and started playing again. Yeah, so Jarrett, yeah, Jarrett really surprised us to be fair. I mean, I mean he, he, he's a fit lad anyway, but um, it, the turnaround on that hamstring injury was uh, significantly quicker than we hoped, even. So that was great news for Jarrett, um, and he was back before we expected. But um, Ben was probably about where we expected two to three weeks. I think he was back in training two and a half weeks after the injury occurred. So that was almost bang on what we expected for that type of injury. Um, and we've also picked up a couple of injuries since then. Yeah, but, I was going to mention the back Andrew Nelson in. one, perhaps, because that looked like it could be quite a serious one when he went down with the hamstring. Mm -hmm. um, but he's come back fairly quickly as well, to be fair. Yeah, so, yeah, we, Nella pulled his hamstring again. Probably a, a grade one plus, so a, a bit of a, a bit of a nasty grade one, but not quite a grade two. 
Um, and again, we expected two to three weeks for him. He's worked, honestly, worked his butt off in the rehab process. Uh, I even joined in a couple of the running sessions with him so I can attest to how fit he is. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's, he's worked really, really hard and, and got his rewards because he's, he's back available for selection now um, and has been for the last week or so, um, which was perfect for that double header over e uh, Easter yeah. where the manager wanted to, to rotate a little bit and just have some fresh bodies in the squad and stuff for, for those two games. So that was uh, grand and then the last one is Johnny and Gandu as well he um, he's been injured for the last couple of weeks with a, a kind of glute related issue that's um, affecting the nerve in the back of his leg probably in terms of being relatable to the, the people listening sciatica type symptoms but not related to anything in his back probably more the muscles in that deep gluteal region so that the buttock area uh, so again, we, we've worked really hard with Johnny. He's, he's applied himself really well. He's been working diligently, even in sessions away from the club. Um, and, and he's returned to training tonight successfully. So yeah, clean bill of health, always a nice update when, when everybody's fit and firing. It's a superb update and a really great position to be in. Obviously, we go into the, the real business end of the season. Now we've got three games left, everything on the line. We really need to, you know, we've got a small squad as it is. So having everybody available can only be a, a fantastic boost. Uh, for Stephen Terry, so really appreciate that update, and, and, and again, massively appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to talk to us. Um, it's been a, a, a real good chat, really enjoyed it, and I'll very much look forward to doing it again soon. Happy days, no worries, thanks Th for your time, mate. Thank you.